Hey guys, we got LT bills going on everywhere. I get calls every day from guys and girls asking about the LT4, the LT5, the LT1s. This is the future. These engines have direct injection, high compression. These engines are going to be supported and produced by GM for the next five or ten years. And we have to face the reality that the LSs and the Hemis, a lot of these designs are five years old. The LSs, in fact, most of them went out of production in 2014-2015 era. So the LT is going to take over the torch and go into the future. So let's take a look at some of these. This is actually an early L83 six-speed 5.3 build that we did. Uh, I'm going to say it's a year and a half old, maybe closer to two. And the customer's been driving it in California. Uh, recently he put on some rock rails and he left the ground strap off for the computer. Now this is a lesson you need to learn. That Jeep computer or PCM powertrain module is grounded by this strap and if you don't ground it there's a chance you're going to fry it and that's exactly what he did. By leaving the strap off he fried his PCM so we're replacing it. You guys all know this Genrite Jeep. You know our JL which we're going to have some updates on real soon. We are doing a LT build in this. This Jeep just got an LT1. We got a Dana 60 in this with a Dana 80 in the rear. TerraFlex suspension. LT1 engine with an 8 speed. This is all new. This is a Gen 4 6.0, which, by the way, is a great engine. They made this 6.0 engine right up through 2019 until. GM releases the heavy-duty Gen 5 at iron motor, which I'm not sure if it's been released yet, but that's going to be a popular engine. So we still do Gen 4 builds, and it makes sense on some of these earlier JKs. This is a, a early two-door, and he does Expedition, so it's going to work out well for him. We're doing an LT build in this. We're doing an LT build in this. In fact, we're about to drop the motor. This is a GM Performance LT1 engine with a 8L90 transmission. Both of these are new from GM. So let's take a look at an LT1 we're about to drop into a chassis. This still has the Camaro water pump on it and you can tell because the water pump and the thermostat housing are on the passenger side. We change these out to the truck drive for several reasons. One, the truck drive is readily available. The truck drive lays out well in a JK, putting the alternator over on the passenger side and the air compressor down low on the passenger side. We also have installed a truck oil pan on this LT1. The LT1 oil pan has a large cooler on the passenger side that can interfere with your drive shaft. This port right here is a water port to cool that oil cooler. And we have a similar setup that I'm going to show you here in just a minute. Another thing you have to be careful with on the truck pan is this oil dipstick tube. It comes up and right here it can hit the steering gear. So what you want to do is you want to take that bracket right there and clearance it like we did or shorten it and keep it tight up against the block so that it doesn't interfere with the steering shaft. As you can see these are our easy mounts which work out really well and if you install our easy mounts in an LT make sure you're running all the brackets that we supply because we have upper brackets, lower brackets and then some support brackets underneath. These engines have so much torque we really beef the brackets up. Wendy's going to show us the easy mounts in the chassis. You can see that we're running a full hydraulic isolator. These are bolt-in mounts. These are our U-brackets. And then underneath the U-bracket is even another bracket. It has not been installed yet. You're not going to install that until the engine's in the chassis and it's been positioned. So let's walk on over and look at a... Uh, before I do, look at this manifold. This is a stainless steel fabricated manifold that GM makes. It's basically equivalent to a shorty header like you would get from Speedway or Summit but you've got heat shields on it. It's a really nice piece, and I do recommend that you stay with a factory manifold if you can. If you've got to run headers, go ahead and do it. All right, so taking a look under this LT1, you can see this plate on the side. We actually made that, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna port the engine oil to an external cooler on the rail. It's gonna be a rail cooler. The original cooler is a large, finned box that would contact your drive shaft, so it just won't work. So we're gonna run that in this build and on future LT1 builds. And here you can see that lower bracket on our easy mount that's been installed. It really boxes everything in and makes this solid. Let's take a look on the passenger side. You can see our oil level sensors hooked up. We've got a long arm in this, so he cut his control arm off. 
Now these manifolds do have plenty of clearance, but just like the LS3, these kind of do dump out close to the upper control arm bracket if you have one, which he doesn't. So you got to kind of angle inward as you come down in this pipe and you're fine. You can see that we're running a factory GM harness with all the original heat protection. We got a factory LT starter motor. Pretty much everything in here is factory. Engine, transmission, wiring harness, computers. Now we are running a 241J in this application and you can see our 8L90 shift cable bracket. It's mounting not only the shift cable for the automatic transmission, which is a really nice thing to have because the new JLs, they've eliminated the shift cable. It's all electronic. This gives you manual control, but it also mounts your transfer case cable. We are running a full-size heavy-duty dual stud transmission mount, which works out really well. Notice that we have our fuel line and our purge line pulled up off the front of the tank, run up to the transfer case and then we wrapped it with heat shield. The exhaust is going to come out way down here so we're going to have plenty of distance and we're not going to have the risk of melting the, the fuel line. We also offer a heat shield that protects the fuel tank and it comes off these two bolts and there's a little L bracket that winds around. The JL has it built in but the JK doesn't. If you're running full skid plates whether it's a V6 or a V8 try to run that shield otherwise you have a chance of melting that plastic fuel tank. Let's walk over to another LT build. All right, as we're walking over, I'm just taking a look here. This is an 8L90 transmission line set, and you will notice that we just get that right from GM. This is our 8L90 clocking ring adapter, and that's all you need to mount your Atlas or your 241J to an 8L90. It's simply a clocking ring. There is no more adapter. You're using the stock GM transmission mount adapter. This is a stock JK EVAP canister. There's the axle vent, and there's a little bracket we supply you with to mount the EVAP canister. There's no extra parts to buy. That puts the EVAP canister up and out of the way of the axle. And if you have it mounted over here, a lot of you guys know that you can damage it easily. This JK does not have the intermediate pipe with a one-way valve for the anti-spitback. There's our fuel vent, our uh, EVAP canister vent valve, which GM controls through the computer. It's not just a blow-off spring or weighted valve in the ESIM like the JK's run. This is an earlier JK because it doesn't have a factory fuel tank pressure sensor. Okay, so this large line here vents into the canister. That's where the fuel vapors go into the carbon canister. The line next to it, that looks like a pretty simple line that goes up to the fuel filler neck, but it's more than that. Inside that white little canister is a fill valve. When differential pressure is sensed by this little line, it drops a fill valve which then opens and allows the vapors to vent into the canister and that allows you to fill the tank quickly. If this breaks off and then you tee it in with this one back here, you're going to have problems. You're not going to be able to fill your tank properly. All that does is goes to the front of the tank because this is a camel hump tank and it needs to have vents on both sides. That's all that rear one does. But this front one actually controls a fill valve, so make sure that you get that hooked up properly. If you break that off, you're going to have a problem. As you can see, our transmission plate is pretty simple. There is no drilling or cutting in this swap. There's our engine mounts. They are full-size hydraulic mounts out of a Cadillac V8 vehicle, so they ride very smooth. This guy does have, I'm noticing, a XD box. XD box can pose a problem. This one may or may not, just depends on what engine you have. I've had guys actually relocate these to make them fit, but if you've got a hydraulic ram in the bottom and he doesn't, in my opinion you don't really need the XD box because all the force is taken up by the ram. Now he doesn't have a hydraulic ram which, which means this XD box is going to take all that energy and put it right through the drag link and then into the sector shaft. So that's not as good as full hydraulics, but if you've got smaller tires like these you don't really need full hydraulics. Alright guys, you might remember this Jeep, we did a video on it a while ago about adding a supercharger onto an LS3. And what he has decided to do, this is his engine over here. His wife bought a JK and discovered up in Colorado it was woefully lacking on power. So we pulled the LS3 out and he's going to put this LS3 6L80 into his wife's Jeep, which I think is a wise move. And we're not going to put a supercharger on this engine. We're going to put this LT4. So here we have stock LT4 engine mounts. These happen to be off of a Corvette. You'll notice that it is a canister type mount. It's a cast aluminum mount with dual studs. 
we're going to run that in this build and we're going to make our own engine frame mounts to match this. Uh, this is a pedestal style mount that came on a Corvette. The Camaro is different, the Cadillac I think is different, but this is what we've chosen to run. You can see the vent or the breather for the crankcase. The LT1s and the LT4s do run a catch can up here and the truck motors don't. For whatever reason that's what GM chose to do. The LT4 runs the dipstick up here which makes it easier up against the steering shaft. You don't have any interference there. This is really a simple compact engine. If you look at the design of this engine it's really not any bigger than the Gen 4. Very slightly bigger than the Gen 4 engines. Yet this engine is going to put out close to 700 horsepower with torque that is pretty much unmatched in its class. Now you will notice that we have a dipstick tube on this LT4 and you say well why is there a dipstick tube in an 8090? Well we figured a way out to put one on because it is kind of a pain to fill the 8090 up from the bottom so we are running this uh, this dipstick tube that we make and that allows you to fill and check the oil level from the top. Alright when he's going to point at the built-in intercooler this is a water to air intercooler there's actually a unit inside the intake and that's going to go up front to a water to air heat exchanger and we're going to show you all that when we uh, when we get to that point. Now our goal on this engine is to run it just like the factory. We're going to be running a factory harness. We're going to try to run the intercooler and the wastegate completely computer controlled. We're not going to run a vacuum operated wastegate or a pump that runs all the time. We're going to have it all integrated into the operating system. I think you can see that the LT4 intake has some significant changes over the LT1. What we're looking at here is basically a TVS blower with an intercooler built into that intake, into the V, into the channel, which makes it very compact. But don't let that fool you. It's still a very powerful engine. And I think what a lot of guys have to understand about these LTs isn't the horsepower, it's the torque. So this 660 horsepower engine is probably going to run right up there with the 700 plus horsepower engines like the Hellcat because of the bottom end torque. We find that these LS3s, even the 525 horse version of the LS3 has a hard time with the LT1 which is only rated at 460 horsepower and it's because of the bottom end torque. And another thing that you really have to take into account is this transmission. The 8L90 as most of you know I wasn't a big fan of at the first 2014-2015 GM had some issues with this transmission but today really from about 2017 on this is an awesome transmission and what Detroit is learning to do is take these high gear transmissions 8 speeds, 9 speeds, 10 speeds, and yes we will be working with a 10 speed at some point and integrating them into the powertrain so that the engines can stay in their power band. So when you take the torque, the CVVT and the direct injection and high compression of these engines and you made it with a high gear transmission, it's just making engines like this obsolete. Not that these engines are obsolete, they still make a good choice for certain applications, but if you want to be future proof, 5 years down the road, 10 years down the road, this is where you want to be. All right, so let's take a look at the chassis. You guys saw this chassis with the body on. Now that it's off, we cut off the weld on motor mounts. This was done a long time ago before we had our easy mounts. And as you can see, these motor mounts held up well. We're right outside of Nellis, guys. Let's let this jet fly over. Okay, so you can see we got long arms on this Jeep. We are going to be using our standard transmission plate. That plate has really turned out to be very... F-35s are loud. That plate has turned out to be very universal. We run it in the early JKs, late JKs, LTs, LSs. It's slotted so front to rear and side to side movement are taken care of. You will notice there is no fuel tank shield on. This was built before we offered that, so we're going to go ahead and install one of those. We do have some beefed up axles on this Jeep, so hopefully that will take the power of this LT4. We're pretty much going to leave all this alone. This has been on here for a lot of years. The EVAP install is going to be the same on the LT4. You can see our fuel tank pressure sensor over here. You can see our vent solenoid over here. Now when it comes to the fuel system, we are going to upgrade the fuel pump. The stock fuel pump is good for 450-ish horsepower in my opinion. This fuel pump is really only going to be used to feed the high pressure pump inside the engine. And I'm not really worried about the pressure. What I'm worried about is the volume. So we're going to refit the fuel pump. This is the electronics for an Atlas transfer case. And by the way guys, I have been talking to Advance and they're going to offer a beefed up Atlas II for the supercharged LT4 engine. 
it's going to have uh, some improved internal components to hold up to the horsepower. Because you got to remember, it's really not just about the horsepower, what it's about is the torque. This is the electronic module for the Atlas, and I've been talking to Advance, Steve Roberts, and they're going to offer a beefed up Atlas II for the LT4 and LT5. It's going to have some improved internal components to stand up to the horsepower. And again, guys, you got to remember, with this build, it's not really about horsepower, it's about torque. And the fact that the LTs can put out tremendous torque right off idle. So if you've got big tires like this, and you hook them up on concrete or asphalt right off the line, something's probably going to let go. Now, he's got some pretty beefy components in this, and I'm not too worried about it. That these LTs are kind of a different breed of engine. They're more like a diesel than they are a gas engine when it comes to bottom end torque. All right, so here's an LT1 that we just finished. It runs and drives great. He's got dual batteries in this. We're charging the air conditioning now. So we're going to come back with a test drive on this Jeep real soon. No. Wendy wants to say something. Go ahead. No, it's all right. I wanted to show the PSC. Okay. So here's our PSC reservoir. And it's a good point because we have two different power steering brackets. We can support both the PSC pump or the factory 3.6 JK pump. Now it does not appear to me he has an anti-splash valve in this. We're probably going to put one in. And really all that is, and yes I have the elder one, is the anti-splash valve seals this. This is open to the atmosphere right now. The stock setup and some of the other setups seal the power steering system so they don't aerate the fluid and start whining and puking fluid out. So this is going to go over to a valve that's going to be mounted right here and it's going to have a little knob on top that you can set the pressure. But basically what it's going to do is it's going to seal the system. This is our engine coolant. Uh, like I said, we got dual batteries in this. Now over here you can see this uh, upper hose with this adapter in it and a port. Now that adapter is not required in this application because you can see the steam port's going into the radiator. But a lot of you guys don't have radiators with steam ports. So if you don't have a radiator with a steam port, you can use this. Use an eighth inch elbow with a quarter inch pipe coming off and that's going to be your steam port. But since we do have one of our radiators in this, 52 millimeter, with a uh, steam port that wasn't required. This is a factory GM harness, factory GM computer, factory GM transmission control module. So pretty much everything in this powertrain is stock GM. I want to mention this Jeep. This is a 5.3 L83 with a six speed. And a lot of you guys think, well, I don't want a 5.3. You remember the old LSs and say, well, it's not going to have enough torque. I think you would be surprised how much power these L83s have. I just did a video on this. You guys can watch it. It was the last video that I posted on the channel. And this LED3, and this only has a 6-speed, not an 8-speed, has no issue at all cruising up the mountain passes, going 80 miles an hour. If you are on a budget, you want an LT engine, you want to run regular gasoline, the L83 5.3 LT is an awesome engine. And I do think that we should be doing more of these. A lot of guys are thinking 6.2, 6.2 because they want top of the line. But the 5.3 is an excellent standard engine for a JK. It'll pull even a JK with 40s if you have to. Um, now, if you're, if you're on 40s in Colorado, that's a different story, but if you're on 40s in Florida or California, this LED3, especially with an 8-speed, will do what you want it to do. Okay, so here's another LT1 that we're just finishing up. Let's take a look underneath. This has got a 8L90 241J. This does have the truck pan on it, as you can see. Easy mounts. Factory GM harness. There's our lower easy mount brackets, stainless manifolds. Now this is not running an oil cooler. We may upgrade them. really depends on what the customer does with this, but I, I don't think this customer is in a really hot area. Now in the later JKs, Jeep started to do better heat protection, and the JL is even one step above this. But they started putting in more heat protection on the floor, on the brake lines and wires. And you'll notice this is that shield I was telling you about that we offer to keep the heat from getting into this plastic fuel tank. And I've actually seen when guys run full skids, and you can see this guy uses his skids, I've actually seen this fuel tank melt right here from the heat. And that's not just an LS thing or an LT thing, that's a JK thing. You notice that we have that fuel line up as high as we can get it. We got it going up to the top of the transmission. There's our vent for both the transfer case and the transmission. So this is an 8L90 transmission with a truck pan. You can see how well these transmission cooler lines lay out. They come off the side of the transmission here. Now, if you do run our heavy-duty cooler, it's going to branch off right here and go out to the rail. 
And we're going to show you some of that coming up. This does not have an engine oil cooler, which we will get to. You can tell this is a truck pan by looking at the oil dipstick tube. That thing with the heat insulation on it is the knock sensor. The thing looks like a little spaceship. That has uh, been moved from the middle of the block to the back of the block. I don't know why GM did that on the uh, Gen 5s, but they did. Maybe it senses the knock better there. They didn't have room for it. You can get a better look at our easy mounts here with the upper and lower brackets. It's a pretty solid setup. It has no problem with these LT1s. So looking at the passenger side here, we have the transmission cooler lines, the 8090 shift lever. This is a stock JK cable. This is our MoTeC shift cable bracket, automatic shift cable up front, transfer case shift cable in the back. And then that harness up there, you will notice that the main harness has this O2 sensor connector coming off. That's our bank one sensor one. That's our upstream. But you'll notice that this harness does not have the rear O2 sensor. And that's right here. Because that O2 sensor comes off the chassis harness. That's how GM chose to do it. So it's a separate harness. And that harness also comes back and does your vent solenoid and your fuel tank pressure sensor. Again, this guy has an upgraded axle. And I think that's pretty much a given in an LT, especially a 6.2. You can break stuff with an LT that you couldn't break with some of the other engines. So he's got A or B lockers. You can tell by the air hose going out. That is a uh, EVAP canister relocation. That's not ours. The customer must have done that before he brought it to us. But he still has the fuel tank pressure sensor and vent solenoid that, that we normally run. On this rear track bar, you want to make sure that it centers the axle when the vehicle is at ride height. Um, I haven't checked that in this vehicle. We'll go out and drive it. And the reason I'm saying that is these LTs have so much torque. When you get on them, the front end comes up. Or when you get on the brakes hard, the front end dives. And you don't want the rear end moving around or the front end moving around. You want them running in the same arc. So make sure that your track bars are matched. I'm not sure if you can see it, but we get our Camaro SS fan, which is a sealed brushless 19-inch fan. That powder-coated pipe is the pipe we use to transfer the coolant from up there at the truck water pump over to the passenger side radiator inlet. We, or we really can't run that radiator inlet, and I say inlet because this is a reverse flow cooling system. We really can't run that on this side because we get the steering gear there. So we have to bring the coolant over here. Notice with this GM harness, we're using all the factory clips and heat protection. Starter Motors got the factory heat protection. He's running steer smart on this, which I've come to like. This axle's got some pretty heavy C's on it and some heavy duty U joints. Make sure you take that into consideration if you're going to do a 6.2 LT swap, just because of the torque that we discussed. All right, guys, so that's the end of this video. I just wanted to show you some of the LT stuff we got going on. I get a lot of calls every day and emails asking questions about the LT. Do we have the LT and the JL? Yes, we do. Are we supporting the 10 speed? Yes, we will. Are we going to support the LT4 and the LT5? Yes, we are. So I will get as much content up on the channel as I can. And a lot of you guys call the shop and talk to Wendy. Wendy's going to try to get some vlogging stuff up as far as what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis so you guys can see what we're doing. If you have any comments on what you want to see, let me know in the comments below. And in the meantime, we're going to drop this LT4 into this chassis. So the LT4 is mocked up in the chassis. We're going to come back with a, another video soon.